Good morning everyone. I am Aditi Ramani. As we move forward to our next session where our panel members will delve into the discussion about poetry a powerful means for sparkling sense and sensibility. Poetry with its unique ability to touch heart and minds offers a reflection of both our deep emotions and our sharpest insights. Today we will explore how this timeless art form brings together reason and feeling inviting us to experience the world through a different lens. Without further ado let's let's welcome our first moderator Surbhi Thanki. She serves as the event director for Tech Prahlad Nagar. Additionally, Surbhi is a member of the editorial board for the Social Digest, a magazine focused on the social and cultural decors. Next, we have Gautam Vegda is an anti-caste poet, illustrator, painter and a PhD research scholar from Gujarat. He has taught a variety of subjects at, at India's premier institutions like IIT Gandhinagar, NID Bangalore, NID Ahmedabad and Gujarat Vidyapi. Dr. Sonali Patnayak is a feminist, poet, academic and a visual artist with a PhD in English literature. She has received numerous accolades including the Panorama International Youth Literature Award in 2024 and the Orange Flower Award for Poetry in 2022. An accomplished academic and a former lecturer at Delhi University, she continues to teach at pre prestigious institutions and advocates for a gender-just society through her art, poetry and activism. Maitri Devi Sasodia, currently Deputy Collector and SDM Bodevili Chotedupur, is a former software engineer with a passion for public service. Her experience with NGOs and leadership organization shaped her commitment to social causes. A writer at heart, her first book, Contemporary Cheer Haran, Women Fighting Indignity and Injustice, focuses on women issues. She is now working on editing her second book, A Poetry Collection. Mr. Mukul Kumar is a civil servant, novelist, poet. Currently, he is working in the Railway Board Ministry of Railways. He published work include three novels and three poetry anthologies. He has been honored with the National Award for Outstanding Service to the Indian Railways, Bharat Nigam, and, uh, and Award for Literary Excellence by Bharat Nenmar Foundation and Purvanchal Gaurav Samman for his contribution to society and bureaucrat and writer. Uh, right, so as Uma Shankar sir mentioned, Maitri ji will be joining us soon. Uh, meanwhile, I would like to request Sonali ma'am and our panelists to read some of their works. Is, am I audible? Yeah? Okay. So, thank you so much, uh, Surbhi, and uh, yeah, thank you everyone for coming for this session. It's Garba time and everyone wakes up late and so on, dancing through the night. So, you know, uh, it's lovely to have so many of you here that you on a Sunday. So, I'll read a poem that's called The Unknowable. Uh, because I believe that, uh, you know, uh, as, as what I have seen in my, you know, years of teaching and time on earth, we are very threatened by things that we don't understand. We are threatened by the other, we are threatened by that which is, doesn't fall easily into our understanding of identity and so on. So this poem is influenced by, I don't know how many of you know, a character called Nabo Gunjara. I am from Odessa. Nabo Gunjara is a nine, um, you know, limbed or nine kind, different beings fused into one. And this character only appears in the Odia Mahabharat, written by Sarala Das, which is very interesting. And what happens is basically Arjun meets the Nabo Gunjara in the forest. And Arjuna is uh, baffled, you know, like what is this creature? And immediately he takes out his bow and arrow to shoot it. Because he can't understand, because it is so because he can't understand, it's horrific to him. And so he thinks he must kill it. So this is my response to uh, that idea. The unknowable. A god who is nine kinds of creatures stitched. No, not stitched. Nothing with needles or thread. More ephemeral, this coming together, fused miraculously through the insane imagination of a crazed poet in love. 
the universe in dazzling corporeality, physical metaphysicality appears. Rooster, lion, snake, peacock, elephant, bull, deer, horse, human. It comes from the same part of vastness, although an achingly long time ago, I learn as I have done, born from the ink of a poet's love of paradox, Sarala's subtle sight, or the, or the forest's haunting fragrance, or perhaps the story's wide open mouth, the unimaginably strange, terrifying and gorgeous one who lives in the mind tongues of artists' hands, as they twist and cross their sinewy elbows, fine fingers and legs and become flowers upon the still water of creation, etching and painting the impossibly enchanting, the haunting, as they bring to bear upon a potachitra, a story art in movement, a nine-bodied planetary being, a kaleidoscopic dancer in the wild, severally limbed, Proud polymorph, a kind of god, a kind of myth, a spectral thing, neither human nor animal, nor both, the Nabagunjara, celestial creature of yore, or that whom only this stupendous earth could give timely birth, you have come to me today as a vision in the dark, as though you wish to whisper to me some ancient secret, I lower my ear and heart and ask, what? Put down your bow, you say. Your imagination is not all. Other imaginations also bear fruit. All seeds to the ground must fall. You need not discard all that you cannot believe or own the world in knowledge. You need not know me nor I you. And yet to each other's truth we may surrender. The polymorphous is not monstrous, neither is the multiple. In many lies the form of one, there is no other truth you are meeting but yourself. Let the cloud of ego melt before the fire of vulnerability and you will see you too have a rooster's plume, a tiger's claw and the stinging and mighty snake as a tail that follows you and raises its hood at wounding memories awakened. Or none of these you are at all, for who knows the self or the other ever. So don't train the arrow at that which you do not know, says to me Nabagunjara. Making a god in your human form, you diminish the possibilities of this oceanic universe. The different and the unknowable also exist within you. Don't train the arrow of subjugation at all that you do not know. Put down that bow. Thank you. Thank you. That was, uh, that was a very touching poem. Uh, I feel like uh, it is often how we behave with insects. Mm -hmm. And I think it's our primal need. Uh, we don't want to become a prey, so we become the hunters. I feel, <laughs> thank you. That is amazing. I All right. Uh, uh, this is Gautam Vigda and I uh, write from the perspective of Dalit environmentalism. Mostly when we write and when we look at the Indian environmentalism, we do talk about ecology, climate change, global warming and different other things. In terms of literature too, we do have uh, narratives around ecology and all. But we sometimes and most of the times fail to uh, question ecology and ecological system and uh, when especially when we talk about you know cultural semiotics and ecology we never look at the ecology from the point of view of caste right because in india when we talk about equal distribution of environmental property environment like public public wells and land and whatever so it is based on caste one way or the other so I write from the perspective, I, I write from the perspective of environmental othering, right? So uh, I have a poem, Breathless. We reached there first. 
even before the bacteria. And worms were formed. We reached there first even before the bacteria and worms were formed to nibble, or to nibble on dead cattle. Even before, the vultures spotted them from an aerial ground to snap and gallop. We spotted them first. Even before the water reached you, we spotted them first even before the water reached you with a mere pickaxe. We reached the water first. You called me feet in your scriptures. You called me feet in your scriptures and burdened me with three massives. Yet, while the head stayed still, the feet got in first. As each time we run out of breath, as each time we run out of breath, we mumbled, we can't breathe. The deaf historians frolicked. We thrived despite adverse stitches. If we dared to confront nature, if we dared to confront nature, who the hell are you historians? Right. So again, this entire idea of Dalit history and Dalit environmental history, where historians, they never wrote about us. We have this entire environmental history of movements where we talk about different other movements. We simply don't talk about Dr. B.R. Ambedkar's Mahad Satyagraha, which was the movement for environmental justice. He was saying that uh, the public wells and public water is the property of everyone, where the Dalits were excommunicated and they were simply denied. They were simply denied the access to water, which is the fundamental right. right. But still, in Indian environmental history, we don't talk about Dr. B. R. Ambedkar and his Mahat Satyagraha as one of the you know, biggest uh, struggle for, uh, for water rights. Right. So, uh, another small poem, uh, organ donation. I too wish to donate organs, just to feel to know. Who requires my perennially parched throat? Or does anyone cry out for my shriveled heart to your bitterness? Not a bad deal in picking my brand new skin. No one has touched it yet. Even my shadow is perpetually untouched. Try my lungs at least once, lest they take a free, deep breath for a moment. Cobwebs have obliterated all the space in my eon-old void intestines. If someone embraces this entanglement and pours some key into it to ooze fire once again, do we get some eye recipients? Then I offer sleepless and desiccated corneas, which is yet to you know, maintain eye contacts with you. But I will never proffer my tongue. But I will never proffer my tongue. Will it ever utter a word for the downtrodden from your mouth? Will it ever utter a word for the downtrodden from your mouth? My tongue will remain equally wetted even after my passing. Vocalizing against injustices. Walls will be raised to the ground. The bamboozling books will shudder. The luminous rays of consciousness will pierce the darkness. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, I will uh, recite two short poems, and uh, two concert thoughts have gone uh, into the choice of this poem. First is the theme of the session, that is poetry as the powerful means of sparking sense and sensibility. So after I recite at the end, I will you know, bring out how it has sparked the sense and sensibility of one of the finest poets of our time, Sukrita Paul Kumar, and that may well be taken as the representation of the emotions it could arouse in the wider section of readers. And second is a uh, second conscious thought that has gone into this, that I believe art has an ennobling in influence. It fosters the human and the social values in society by striking the chord of empathy in the readers. Because empathy, you know, is the most, uh, is the strongest conduit between the reader uh, and the book or any artistic or art literary creation. It sets, it easily sets the, the uh, you know, chord of compassion vibrant in a reader. So uh, these are the two poems and these are born of the actual sites uh, because that is how, and they, they represent the, uh, you know, quite some um, 
uh, like my, you know considerable amount of my poetry exploring the you know social values because you were talking about the themes also so that way it will cover a wide section of my poetry other two being nature and philosophy of course so here goes the poem the beggar it was you know written way back in 2001 and 12 you know for one and two and this poem ended up entering into the international you know, library of poetry usa the beggar this poem is very special for the two, uh, you know, its imagery and symbol. So here goes the poem, The Beggar. A beggar, limbless, armless, the fragments barely clad, the begging ball tied to one of the arms. He rolls over the pathway along the garment shops. I will, you know, like to draw your attention to the juxtaposition of a naked, almost naked, uh, you know, beggar against the garment shop. He rolls over the pathway along the garment shops and stomachs out a cacophonous score. His voice is getting drowned. His voice is getting drowned into the clatter of his stones, raining into his empty ball. So, you know, this is the image like uh, his ball was empty. But the poet is able to see the clatter of his stones raining into his empty ball because clatter of his stone happens to be the symbol of the heart devoid of passion. You know, the second poem again is born of the actual, uh, you know, sight, real sight. The street acrobat. The street acrobat is like, you know, street gali pe, jo gali mein kalabaj dekhte hai. It is a very common sight, uh, you know, for us. The street acrobat, he walks with his hands upside down. He walks with his hand upside down. His head is stirred by shame. His head is stirred by shame, but his inverted intestines coil around his head. But his inver inverted in intestines coil around his head and steady it in balance. Blind to the audience, he navigates meticulously. Blind to the audience, he navigates meticulously. Even quite a while hence, he notices that he is navigating only over the concrete and no currency. In not long, in not long, he watches a horde of intestines furiously leaping out from the undifferentiated bodies. He watches a horde of intestines furiously leaping out from the undifferentiated bodies. They flog him back upon his feet. This poem is a very subtle, you know, commentary on the avarice and uh, consumerism in our society. And just I will illustrate uh, the response of uh, Sukhita ma'am to these two poems while, he, uh, while she uh, gave her blur for my book, uh, Catharsis. These, these two poems belong to that poetry collection. About the beggar, she says, the beggar offers a well-conceived poetic experience in a condensed form when the clatter of his stones in the empty ball of the beggar leaves a strong impact on the reader's consciousness. And about the street acrobat, these two poems she you know, loved, this, about the street acrobat, she says, a street acrobat, for example, is a convincing experiment in using is it a convincing experiment in using imagery that can jostle well that can jostle one into a rather surreal, nightmarish experience. So that is what we are talking about, how poetry sparks your sense and sensibility. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. First of all, I would like to uh, my, pay my compliments to my distinguished panelists. All the poems were very flavorful and we'll obviously discuss in the sessions ahead. I will be reading out two short sonnets from uh, Moments and Eternities, a poetry collection that was launched yesterday. Uh, first of them belongs to uh, Echoes of Self, uh, one of the sections of the poem which uh, deals with you know, self-reflection and introspection. 
Um, it is my way of paying ode to the titans of uh, uh, women authors, you know, you, who I have found inspiration in. Uh, the title goes, I belong. In the treaties of life, I find my place, like Plath within her Belgia, confined yet bold. Echoing the struggles of the human race as dreams and darkness weave their stories told. Wolf whispers softly in a room of her own where thoughts unfurl like petals in the light. Daring women to claim the seeds they have sown, to craft their narrative, to stand and fight. Dickinson's hope flickers like a distant star, a quiet strength that pulses through the night, while Boa challenges, urging us to spar to break the chains and step into the light. Through varied voices, I discover my song. Self-conscious and fierce, I find where I belong. Uh, this is from uh, Echoes of Self. I'll read one more poetry from Whispers of Cosmos. It is a section that deals with universe. It has a tinge of existentialism with it. Um, this is uh, one of my personal favorites from the collection. It talks about uh, so the sun will, our sun in the solar system will eventually turn into a red, uh, red giant like two billion years from now. Uh, so we, uh, this is sun as a red giant. When the sun becomes a red giant, it will swell, a fiery titan casting crimson rays. Its core collapsing, a dance of fierce spell as hydrogen whispers farewell to its days. With each pulse, it will engulf the inner spheres, mercury scorched, reduced to cosmic dust. Venus a furnace, it, its atmosphere sears, and Earth in its heat will witness its thrust. Forests will ignite in a slow golden blaze. Rivers will boil over, skies churn with despair. Life as we know it will fade in the haze as nature succumbs to this solar glare. Will you and I wander then in some distant sky, in a galaxy new, perhaps where stars softly sigh? Thank you. It was a beautiful poem, ma'am. Uh, so I will now uh, move on to the questions that I have prepared for this panel. Uh, Maitriji, I would like to start with you. Um, so, uh, talking about your previous collection of work, that is Contemporary Cheer Haran, I noticed that it is a mixed genre book where it has essays and open letters and poetry. Uh, so, how did the transition from a mixed genre collection to a completely poetic work like Moments and Eternities, uh, how did it influence your choice of subject matter and do you think this shift in form has a distinctive advantage or a disadvantage? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, so, Contemporary Cheer Haran is an anthology. It has poetry, short stories, essays. Uh, I'll just briefly talk into how it came, in, uh, came about. So, it was actually an angry reaction to, you know, when I was pretty young, 2013, when Nirbhaya happened and after that, uh, a friend of mine and I, we used to write for magazines and newspapers, so we thought we should, it was purely out of anger, but then obviously we, uh, you know, made it more creative. I am essentially, what I've written more is analytical pieces and essays, so that comes easy to me. Uh, I did some short stories for the book which were based on actual real stories. So that book, uh, you know, that was the uh, trigger or that was the, uh, uh, you know, inspiration for that. Uh, when I talk about moments and eternities, I have written poems, but uh, I never saw myself as a, you know, full-fledged poet. Uh, so I think uh, uh, there was something that we discussed in the you know, uh, session yeah, launch yesterday that as much as you, you know, create your creations kind of craft you. So I uh, thank Moment and Eternities to, you know, having awakened that poet in me. Um, the subject matter for it, uh, uh, it deals with duality of existence, like how ephemeral and the eternal are in constant play. Uh, the title Moments and Eternities comes because of that. Uh, I had written existential sort of poetries um, through, uh, I mean, in the past few years. But uh, when crafting a collection, uh, 
this was my thought that I wanted to structure it in a way that it plays around a theme. And to have a poetry collection, you know, tied to a theme is like trying to make a water sculpture. It's what I said. So uh, still, I uh, made an attempt. Uh, Moments in Eternities del uh, deals with this essential duality that is constantly in, you know, constantly every time in life we feel this. I say that the rivers of eternal and rivers of the ephemeral, the short-lived and the, you know, the bigger picture are constantly flowing into the sea of existence. That's how I see it. And uh, I have divided it across five sections, um, nature, time, self, uh, uh, love and universe to give better concept, uh, context and tie it up. So all the poetries go section wise. Uh, now talk, coming to your second sub question that is, uh, is there an inherent disadvantage with it? I think I'm pretty new to my literary journey, but I feel all forms of uh, writing have their own, uh, you know, utility. And I think uh, as creative people, uh, the biggest takeaway apart from it all is, you know, the ability to kind of resonate with someone. Even if, you know, one person could, uh, res because you don't know the way you think, the frame of your mind, you don't know how many of uh, people would connect with that. So I think writers essentially the best of takeaway is to, you know, find that reach and see that, you know, someone resonated with it and it probably made a small impact in their life. And poetry is, I feel, a very powerful medium because with novels, stories, you will find that people who are readers would more, you know, uh, go to that. But poetry is a very accessible sort of uh, reading. People who don't read also might, you know, come across a poetry and read it and it's quick, so, you know, it could trigger the thought. Sir read out poetry is about uh, uh, two street scenes and made such a beautiful poem out of it that everybody could visualize. So that is the power of this medium. Uh, I don't think that uh, it takes away any due from other mediums of writing. But um, poetry is very powerful because of its accessibility, because of the quick thought it could trigger to the reader. So I find that as an advantage um, with the poetry. Thank you. Beautifully said, ma'am. Uh, my next question would be to uh, Sonali, ma'am. Uh, so uh, I've often seen this dilemma in poets where they have to either choose the commercial path or they could write, uh, you know, what they desire. So as a poet, how do you negotiate this tension between the pursuit of artistic expression and the ethical responsibility to address pressing social issues? Yeah, it's a very good question. Thank you, Surbi. So I was writing poetry since uh, the age of 13, and I had no sense of commerce, obviously, at that point. So I think I was uh, lucky in that sense that that journey began so early, and a space, I would say, was extremely uh, innocent of the privileges I had or did not have, you know, so material privileges and loss of privileges in terms of gender and so on, so many things. So I personally never ever actually sit to, you know, make that distinction between what would sell and what would not. In fact, I didn't write a lot of, I know for instance with um, attention spans dwindling and so on, you know, a lot of people are given to writing, let's say, shorter poems, quicker, you know, with an impactful end and so on. That was never something that I have long poems you've seen in my book, lots of long poems. I enjoy that because, but for my background as a professor of literature, I'm very comfortable with the long form. And in fact, I encourage people to stay with the long form because nothing to say, you know, against haiku or other short forms or anything because that also requires a lot of, uh, and poetry, Surbi, I don't know, it, it's not uh, one of those things that's not a bestseller anyway. Right? You have to sort of, you know, you have to go to it, you have to stay with it, you have to work for it. It's, it's like finding that diamond or whatever, you know. Uh, it's something that comes with a lot of sweat and uh, immersive experience. You can't just read that one poem and feel uh, excited. It's not your go-to self-help book either. So it really doesn't have that market. So for me, I write from a position of uh, completely knowing myself and what, uh, where my angst is, where my pleasure is, uh, what questions bother me. 
and never from the point of view of is this going to work, is this going to resonate or the least, you know, we live in a capitalist world but the least if this is actually going to bring uh, capital. So that's what I do. I don't know about other poets but yeah. <laughs> uh, but that's, uh, I feel grateful that you come from that position because with poets, uh, and it's unfortunate that they have to sort of streamline their work so that it brings them capital and so much uh, honesty and anger and uh, important thought gets lost Absolutely. in streamlining the work. Uh, absolutely. Like, I, uh, I'll just add quickly, Surbhi, I have a short poem that, you know, just uh, uh, the last two lines, it's about courage. It says, you know yourself, you know, hold that knowledge close. And uh, the, the, the point of courage is it goes, walk, sway, you know, uh, curl your toes as you go, take it all the way, take it all the way. So I really feel that that's the courage of poetry. If you don't go all the way, if you feel like I must tread this careful line, mm -hmm. this is not the right time to say the right thing, that is not good poetry for me, at least. Whether it sells or not, that's a different matter. But that's not good poetry. Uh, thank you, ma'am. It was. Uh, okay, moving on to uh, Gautam, sir. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, as you mentioned that you talk about uh, Dalit and marginalized uh, issues in your poetry and uh, especially in concern with nature. And poetry, I have noticed, it, all, it often explores the interconnectedness of life, of how everything is connected to everything. Uh, so, how crucial do you find the exploration of ecological interconnectedness is in your work, especially in concern to marginalized communities? Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for this particular question. Uh, mostly when we talk about anti-caste literature or Dalit literature, which uh, I'm also a part of, uh, so when we talk about that, so it's not the literature of, you know, observance. It's the literature of experience. We experience things. People say, I, we don't observe caste because you don't experience it. Yeah. You're the oppressor. So that's why when Dalits, they are writing, when, you know, people from the particular community, they are writing, so they have their own experiences that the other community will not have, right? So that's why they do not have the authority or maybe the authenticity of experience. So when I say, uh, you know, when I talk about uh, the dead cattle or dragging of the dead cattle, my mother used to drag dead cattle, right? And uh, we used to work, uh, we uh, tanning and eating uh, rotten carcasses and also not being allowed to touch and to be touched, not being allowed, uh, not to be allowed to uh, walk on the public street and things like that, right? So again, uh, this, are, this is the part, that's why I'm saying that each and every experience of our lives are connected uh, with this ecological burden sometimes and ecological othering where we are not supposed to walk on the land, on the street. The street is very much part of the ecology and where we are othered, right, intentionally and historically, right. And even still, every day we find the same, uh, like, uh, space where we are uh, given that kind of, uh, you know, hints uh, to know that who you are, right? So uh, it's 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 experiential. Uh, when we talk about you know vultures, so the the vultures that you talk about is the vultures like Ramayana vultures, Jatayu, right? The king of vultures and things like this. It's a very divine vulture. But we have seen the vultures. We have uh, you know coexisted with vultures. I have seen what vultures does. I have seen the biological vulture. I have seen, I, you know, the entire committee of vultures, what do they do? And that, that ferocity is such that that particular geographical site that we live, that no one comes because it, it's stinking, it's, it's horrific, it's terrible, it's terrific, right? So we have been into that ghastly space and we have lived with original vultures. Right now, vultures are not there. Due to diclofenac uh, uh, drug, the vultures are almost extinct. And uh, due to, since again, when we talk about climate change and everything, we never talk about that geographical space. When vultures go extinct, it's we. We had to eat much more than we used to do before. So, who will eat it? 
अभी वल्चस नहीं है तो गाय मर गई है भैंस मर गई अभी अगेन वी कॉल दैट यू नो काउस बट अगेन अ वेरी सेंक्रोस एंड काइंड ऑफ एनिमल्स अगेन बट वेन इट कम्स टू वेन यू मिल कैन यू द काउ इज डेड दे यूज टू कॉल अस कि ले जाओ खा जाओ राइट टैनिंग कर लो कुछ भी कर लो सो वी वी हैड टू एक्सपीरियंस ऑल दिस थिंग्स वो हमारे हमारे जियोग्राफिकल उसके अंदर होता था दैट वॉज द केस सो आवर इकोलॉजी इज डिफरेंट इकोलॉजी दैट्स वाई एम सिंग दैट्स वाई आई टॉक अबाउट दलित एनवायरमेंटलिज्म दैट यू डोंट नो द हॉर ऑफ दैट या थैंक यू इट वॉज अ वेरी क्रूशल पॉइंट दैट आई फील यू जस्ट पॉइंटेड आउट वेर यू टॉक्ड अबाउट पीपल हु कम फ्रॉम अ पोजिशन ऑफ प्रिविलेज सी द माइथोलॉजिकल बींग्स वर्सेज समबडी हु हैज एक्सपीरियंस डिट सी द बायोलॉजिकल फॉर्म ऑफ इट सो दिस narrative of uh, you know and uh, uh, in the contemporary times we see that uh, a lot of poets write poetry about the issues faced by dalits and they don't come from a background which is anti caste and i feel like uh, the community again suffers more because they are being spoken for and uh, not spoken of in fact be- quickly just not to interrupt bell hooks uh, african american writer black writer she says this this is the greatest danger of intellectualism you can take somebody else's voice the marginalized voice and make it your own and then sell it uh, for that so that's the danger that that's also part of the interconnectedness you know the discursive interconnectedness of something like ecological uh, and environmental studies the elite can uh, take it for themselves and then co-opt Uh, Dalit identity or anti-caste identity for uh, their own gain, and then that becomes a very different uh, discussion. Definitely, and uh, that is why I have chosen to write in English because again there are very few writers. I am the only Dalit writer who comes from uh, you know Gujarat who writes in English mm-hmm. in Gujarat. So again, there is like these spaces are so empty, and and there are people who like take uh, take out our uh, our pain and suffering, and they. they just sell it so i i just don't want to talk about my pain and suffering i do i do want to assert i do have the aspirations and that's why i do talk i i sometimes right now i write about you know this concept of science fiction so i want to touch the sky i want to touch the galaxies i just want to go to like witness the space and all i just want to go beyond i want to go go global as well as cosmic mm-hmm. right so pura us space mujhe nahi dena so abhi mere aspirations hai i i'm not the old dalit i'm new dalit right so that's the concept yeah thank you i hope you do reach the cosmic level sir <laughs> uh my next question would be to mukul sir um so as you mentioned earlier your poetry covers a diverse catalog of uh, themes especially with philosophy social issues and nature uh now what i want to ask you is how does the thematic focus of your work influence your poetic style uh, be it form or other te- technical aspects of it <coughs> well uh, at the outset let me clarify that uh, a poet never chooses a particular theme in a very conscious manner of course when john keats says that poetry should come to a poet as naturally as leaves comes to the trees uh, it being city according to me it implies not only the emotions uh, the muses but it subsumes everything the style the articulation and the themes also so every poet i think that this muse keeps varying from poet to poet and a particular poet may you know end up writing dealing with a variety of themes like my poems uh, like rhythm of the ruins uh, uh, was my latest poetry collection also one of the poets says uh, his poetry covers a wide range of themes and emotions from the appreciation of the luminous divine mystery embedded in every scene in nature to the scandalous poverty perceived in a bombay slum love death nature reconciliation there is hardly any aspect of existence or any state of the human mind left untouched by the poets yeah, omni sign pair so what i mean to say ki after you have written quite some poetry then you tend to look back and only then certain pattern emerges ki okay these were the themes you have reflected on these are the themes you have dealt with so uh, i don't think uh, and you know while uh, writing while exploring the social issues of course the language will be more uh, uh, like direct it will be bold and while you deal with nature there's certain music naturally comes into your words 
So it is like the resonance between the man and the theme you are, you are dealing with. So poet enjoys that resonance, that, that resonance, and that powers his creative journey. So that is how it is. Very nicely said, thank you so much. Um, I'll do quick questions now that we're running out of time and then we'll move to the audience questions. Uh, so, uh, Maitriji, as you earlier talked that your uh, collection often deals with identity and I feel like uh, as humans we often have this stubbornness to have a stable identity but the nature of identity itself is ever changing. So how do you think through poetry can we tell our audience that while you know we may desire to have a stable identity it is okay to be fluid with our identity thank you for that question surbi and uh, the you know the central idea of uh, the poetry collection that occurs talks about this and one section is devoted to these echoes of self. Uh, so like you said, everything is fluid, right? Um, Sharn or Shashwat are constantly tied up. What you are this moment, you are not the next moment, biologically, intellectually, in every way, right? You're constantly evolving because of the circumstances, because of the choices you make, uh, because of external influences and your own internal core uh, moral compass or the thinking that comes to you. Uh, so, uh, you know, essentially when I speak about uh, this um, in Echoes of Self, I try to, uh, the, uh, my poetry style is sonnets because I'm very comfortable in that form. I think it's a structure, a classical structure. I do free sonnets, not the proper, you know, uh, syllable uh, embedded ones but uh, 14 lines I feel is uh, uh, you know good four quatrains and two couplets are good to give a thought and uh, that has just naturally come to me and since long back whenever I started writing I uh, write in this form poetry uh, so in the poems I try to you know in some the endings are questions where uh, you have like um, well the poetry that I read out son as a red giant it ends with a question which kind of you know it takes you through what will happen when son will become a red giant and then it makes you think that okay we might be in some other galaxy by then you know it's far-fetched in time so uh, that is uh, my thinking of it, to leave with questions or then to end with, uh, you know, powerful endings where it tells you that you are not the same person. Everything changes and change is constant. Uh, there's inherent duality that we need to, you know, uh, reconciliate with and that way probably we'll have more meaningful human existence because you have to, you know, seek solace in the timeless that everything is eternal but you have to identify the beauty of the transient as well um, so that essentially is the theme of whole collection and i try to you know communicate that in different uh, poems through different portals um, so i think that suffices to answer your question thank you thank you so much it does uh, and i feel like in capturing a moment you often make it eternal, especially yeah. when it comes to poetry and other artistic forms. Very impressionist in nature. Thank you so much. Thank you. Of course. Uh, moving on to the next question. Um, to you, Sonali, ma'am. So, uh, uh, as Sir mentioned, there is a natural musicality when we talk about nature. Uh, and nature is often romanticized when we talk about its beauty, and you know how it is uh, it brings comfort to us but how important do you think it is to strike a balance between this romantic uh, portrayal of nature versus uh, you know uh, uh, the need for acknowledgement of the ecologic ecological degradation uh, interesting, like I wouldn't even think it's a balance at all. When I write poetry, I don't like, uh, he was also saying earlier in Gotham and everyone said it in their ways. I don't consciously 
you know, say that I'm going to write a nature poem. Sometimes you are asked for submissions and so on. That is happening a lot. Uh, and I find it very difficult to respond exactly to that idea. So I would not think this is a balance at all. When we think about nature, uh, it's also not just an object. You know, like when we teach romantic poetry, we all know William Wordsworth and so on. So I have to unlearn a lot of that also as a professor. And you know, the, that's the balance I have to strike, so be the poet and the professor. So when, what we teach is often that, you know, uh, the romantics use nature for certain ideas about individualism, the self and so on. But today when I write, I think more than uh, individual quarrying uh, and uh, you know I think of Dalit poetry and Gotham's poetry it's very humbling to think about his relationship you know and that community's relationship with nature and a more privileged relationship with nature but it's never a balance there is beauty and because of that beauty there is also that precarity that sense of you know what is going to happen when it is demolished when it is taken away from you and as I grow older when I was younger now this is another transformation I've seen I was in a way one with nature uh, we would play we would from a tree we would turn it into fish and we would say okay we are cooking fish and so on that was my idea with nature the more learned uh, journey with nature is that you kind of also fragment yourself from nature you see it as other oh tree how beautiful you are and so on and so forth my process is also now of unlearning that and recognizing how we are indeed interconnected in so many ways, one with nature. And the beauty ought to also remind us of other aspects of it. The, uh, the, uh, you know, the idea of the burden of uh, caste or you know, who does the work, labor as far as nature is concerned and so on. And what is left of this earth when we are going and you know, mining and quarrying and just about you know, taking it, denuding it in a way. What nature are we speaking about? So that paradox, I think, is something that we ought to be uh, you know, very conscious of as poets. You can't uh, glorify it on the one hand and also not talk about the degeneration, which will leave us uh, with nothing on the other hand. Yeah. I hope that answers. Uh, so it did. And uh, I like the idea of uh, unlearning in order to learn more about the things we need to speak about more. Uh, I'll quickly move on to uh, the next question that I have for uh, you, Gautam, sir. So, uh, coming from the background that you come from, to what extent does uh, a poet bear the responsibility to amplify marginal marginalized voices, whether it's in relation of social issues or uh, environmental aspect or any other subject matter? So uh, nowadays, like there's this trend to get uh, assimilated, right? So they change their surnames, they hide their identity, and they ha they tend to hide their identity identity because they are prone to violence, right? And and that is what it is. So they don't want to, you know, uh, to be prone to any, any 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 violence, and that's why they don't come up with the identity. There are very few Dalit writers. There are many Dalits. There are many who writes. Uh, many who write, but only some of like me or maybe there are many other young writers. So they come and they assert their identity and they just they do talk about that. I'm not the old one. I'm not the one that you like, were, like oppressed or victim. But I'm the one who has been like you have inflicted violences upon us. But still we rose up, and uh, right now uh, like we have the aspirations and the kind of aspirations that is of some other level, right? So yeah. So that's why it's it's very important to come out and say and speak i know we are right now the it's it's getting worse the situation like uh, the the right to speak uh, and uh, speech and everything is it's it's not that uh, free but uh, we should speak what I whatever is the result yeah absolutely and in doing so i feel like layer by layer we get out of the hegemony and the marginalization that we have been you know put in um, yeah um, moving on to, unfortunately, the last question of the session. Um, so uh, you explore philosophy in your poetry, as you mentioned. Uh, so how do you think uh, nature acts as a mirror to the human condition? And uh, 
what insights about humanity can be drawn from this connection? Yeah, let me first, uh, uh, you know, explain my relationship with nature as a poet. Of course, nature operates at, you know, uh, basically two levels for me. First, as a poet, it is an eternal muse. Uh, it is an inexhaustible source of metaphors and symbols for you by way of its beauty. And that is the accessory of art. So that is one level. Second is like nature is an instant gateway to divinity. Like Frank Lloyd Wright says, okay, I believe in God, but only I spell it nature. The moment your gaze tends to stay at nature, you are filled with that sense of awe and wonder that who created, you know, this order. And uh, there must be a supreme authority, supreme, uh, you know, power that must have created this order. And then you tend to believe in God. So that is how it inst instant gateway to divinity to God. But coming for a philosopher, and nature, I think his take on nature is a little different. When Albert Camus talks of philosophical suicide, and when you talk of philosophical suicide, that implies that you stop believing in the existence of God. You don't take the existence of God for granted. You don't take destiny for granted. And then you are caught up in all those questions, like who created it? What is the purpose of life? Why am I here? What is my relationship with the universe? What is the purpose of existence? And that is how absurdism was born, when Albert Camus says the philosophical suicide. So for me, I think, they say that the clearest path to universe is through the wilderness of forest. So I, most of the times I am, I, am, I am in the wilderness of forest. So that is how, uh, uh, you know, a philosopher interacts with nature and how nature inspires his philosophy, because that is the power of philosophy to frame different answers to the same questions. So that is how he you know, produces beauty in the process. Third part uh, that will end up answering your question, how it offers the imagery for the human condition, a very, very short poem, like a poet who is uh, like uh, gloomy, in his gloomy moments, how nature offers the imagery and ultimately without any change in the material condition of the poet, it brings tears to his gloom. So, that is, uh, uh, this poem is titled The Resonance, and the resonance is that I am inert through the shifting hue. He's looking at, so, you know, he is reflecting on nature. I am inert through the shifting hues. The silver gets oxidized as the fire mutates to ember. It is a monotonous kaleidoscope. The ember is dying into ashes. The ember is dying into ashes the evening at the doorstep of night. The evening at the doorstep of night. As the dusk dawns, I sparkle a wondrous suddenness, a redeeming resonance. The shade is a perfect mix of hope and despair. So that is how the, you know, you know, re, uh, this nature resonates with the sensibility of the poet. Thank you. That's a beautiful juxtaposition right there, where it's a mix of hope and despair together. Yeah, uh, I would request to uh, take some questions from audience. This has been a wonderful uh, discussion. Yeah, audience, questions please. We have 10 minutes, beautiful, wonderful poets with us. You can ask some questions, please. Raise your hands and uh, you can tell with whom you want the answer. Yes, someone there, back. At the back, yes. Hello everyone, I am Priyanshi Agrawal from IIT Gandhinagar and my question is to Dr. Sunali. Uh, since you said that lo uh, long poems are, uh, is your favorite ones and I too write long poems, I write stories in my poems and uh, I want to ask that in this zamane uh, where attention span is very low, how will long poems survive? Thank you. That's a beautiful question. I think it has to survive on its own grit, really. <laughs> you know, uh, that generation, if there is such a, you know, I don't want to honestly uh, to, uh, homogenize, uh, you know, one particular generation as losing, but that's something we hear a lot. And it's also, as educators, a lovely question. I think it's also our duty, and as poets, you know, in sessions like this, to educate the public to be able to listen better. And 
and to be able to listen longer. If we start that practice at an early age, whether you call it meditative or whether you call it just, you know, increasing attention spans just by listening to music, we will also, um, you know, have created a space for the long poem as a form. So we don't go from there to here, we start the other way. We start by creating generations which listen to each other better, which have better attention spans and so on. And the power of a long poem, I mean, you, you can't take it away. The other quick thing I want to say is another way of it surviving is uh, extracting lines from it. We do that with Shakespeare and so on. We remember, you know, very four, you know, powerful four lines. We don't remember the rest. That's one way in which longer forms also survive. Oral tradition, memory, and extracting and remembering some and passing it down. Thank you for that lovely question. Someone at the back, that side. Yeah, you have some question? Yeah. Yes. Uh, good morning. My name is Chelsea and uh, I, uh, I really got inspired by your point of view. So one of my friends, uh, is uh, she's very passionate about reading novels and poems. Not only that, she also uh, finds new words and she creates poems on her own self. Whenever I see her, that the beauty of the literature and the poem is still alive in this generation. So my question is that to Maitri ma'am, that uh, I want to know that what is the major point or importance that a poem or a novel plays in one's life? I think, uh, you know, thank you for that question and uh, kudos to your friends who, a friend who writes poetry like that, finding new words. I think we are all like, inherently explorers by nature, even when we are creating, like human as species. So when we are creating also, we kind of exercise that exploration and see, you know, where it takes us. Like all of them said, all my distinguished panelists about what is their process, creative process. And, uh, you know, it is said that the poem comes to you. Uh, I would uh, say something about, uh, you know, just one line, very celebrated Indian author, uh, revered Ruskin Bonser. He says that as long as you can write something about nothing, you will write and you will, you know, you will be fine. So it's not about writing something about nothing, but it is about seeing it in that light, uh, like Sir's poem, The Beggar or The Street Acrobat. You know, you might pass by such scenes hundreds of times and not have thought anything about it, but a poem like that will make you see it in a new light. And I think that is the power of a poem as a creator. It gives you that, you know, point of view. And as a reader, that it gives you that perspective. So I think it is doubly enhancing and giving in that way. And that is the power of poetry or for that matter, any form of literature. Thank you so much. Yeah, hello. Uh, this is to all the panelists. As a former, like as a poet myself, there are a few questions that I want to ask. One is like, what does it take for you to accept you are a poet? Because as someone who has studied literature in Xavier's, I have always seen a standard set for us, like, you know, when it comes to poetry. So at what point in the journey do you start accepting that you are a poet rather than doubting yourself? Then the other question is like, after an interval, like, you know, after you have written something, after a, like, you know, brief interval, do you always feel like, you know, you could have done better with the poem? Like, do you want to change something and stuff like that? Like, you know, the third question is, what is your refinement process? Like, you know, as it connects to the second question, like, you know, how would you refine your poems? Uh, like a specific word that resonates with you more now that you have like, you know, spend a separate, like, you know, a, a quality time away from it. And the last question for me would be is like, you know, where do you draw the line? Like, you know, especially when it comes to like your bias, your edginess, your, di your diabolical, like, you know, thought systems and all of that stuff. Like, you know, where do you draw the line? Where are you crossing the path where like, you know, you are actually called a lunatic? like to answer the you know first question uh, the first question is how uh, you get confident that you are a poet you go as a poet to uh, the society and the public at large i will just share my experience i have been writing uh, verses i will not say poetry verses very unconsciously i used to scribble a few verses in my very formative year a school boy sitting uh, in a quiet corner and very reticently uh, you know, scribbling verses and keeping them to him, his own self, himself, uh, you know, because he was not confident how it will go out, what he is writing. 
So that approval, that validation which you are talking about, ki when you start thinking. So I was lucky that my father happened to be a you know, professor of English literature. So after, uh, uh, you know, after I uh, was continuing this journey of scribbling verses, then uh, there came a juncture of my life uh, as a college kid. I showed uh, certain verses to him, ki, okay, this is what I have written. I don't know what they are uh, and how it will go out to the world. Then he said, ki, okay, uh, these, I think, muse-wise, it is wonderful, expression is good. But you are gripped with the thought, because I, had, I never studied poetry in a very scientific manner, like what is the meter, what is the rhyming. And, uh, you know, poetry has got certain scientific principles. But you are lucky that you are born in the times when poetry has been liberated from the stylization. If we are writing in blank words, we are writing in free words, all sorts of experimental, you know, experiments are going on. And, you know, still I was not very confident in spite of that validation coming from him. But later, this journey continued around 2012, 13, after having put in almost 14, 15 years of first service, I must be in my late 30s or 40. Then at that time, I think I showed it to a few poets whom we call poets, whom we look forward to as inspiration, the, uh, the sources of inspiration. Then they also told me creative piece is a creative piece, literary piece is a, you know, you know, figurative piece. Don't have to bother about the form, about the style, just go on writing, you are doing a wonderful work. So I think keep continuing this journey of literature, of creative expression, without getting feeling burdened with a sense of style, with a sense of form, so, and uh, that is how all sorts of experiment are going on in literature. Thank you. We can uh, take only two short questions and short answers, please. Two, yes, Mike, please. Aap ye bhi batana ki kis se puchna chahte ho? Oh, well, first and foremost, I would like to say, or I would rather appreciate every one of you. You have been very eloquent and very, very, very powerful with your words. It was really uh, affecting every, each and every one. Now, my question really is when we, uh, you know, compare, like we were in the session one and then we were in the session two, how, how will the vernacular poetry reach everyone? Because today each and every person is speaking in English. Even right now we are communicating in English. So how can we, you know, uh, write in vernacular and reach the uh, audience at the same time? Thank who you. should Who should answer this? Any of the panelists would be fine. Anyone, please, short. Yeah. No, I, okay, very quickly, I think that's a really good question. Um, there's a lot of vernacular writing that we are not aware of. We, uh, it's happening because we all speak only in English or Hindi sometimes, or, you know, these are the languages in currency. Translation, I think that's, uh, and translation is very important today, and thankfully a lot of work in translation is happening. Of course, the problem there is it all gets translated to English and hence the currency of English continues to be alive. I think the other thing is to just respect the vernacular and create more spaces for that to happen. In curriculum, we try to bring in vernacular literature through translation. So you hear that, we teach it like that. You hear that and then you also hear the translated poem. Many people don't know the lot of English writers we think are English or not English writers. They are actually translated. They are Greek writers, writers who write in Latin and so on, and Portuguese and so many other languages, but we took it for granted that it's English. So I think translation is one of the big ways in which we cross that hurdle, but also to respect. Uh, and that is a process of decolonizing. We have to really decolonize our minds and go back to you know roots or what really makes us. And Indian languages are so beautiful. We ought to we ought to write more and listen to yes each other more in those languages. With that, we conclude it. It has been a wonderful discussion. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Upendranath Rena, Dr. Purnima Bhatt, and Priyanshi Patel to kindly felicitate the speakers. Yes, Priyanshi ji. Priyanshi ji, please come, come on the stage. And who was the other? No, no, it's Upendranath Rena ji. And Dr. Purnima Bhatt, please. Uh, 
über die Form des. Also, ich sage dir, der Sophie, uh, the moderator first, yes, please. Anyone in name? Thank you. 